Good evening. I'm Bruce Moore from the East Longmeadow Historical Commission, and this is our spring program. We do two programs a year. There, we're going to be doing a fall program in September uh, with Bill Moss. He's uh, an actor, so we look forward to having him here in the fall. Um, this evening, we're very pleased to have with us Richard Colton from the Springfield Armory. He's the He's a, his, he's a historian for the armory and a arms expert, safety expert over there. So at this time, I'd like to turn the mic over to Richard, and thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the program. Yeah, thanks. It, it helps me to have a t shirts with my name on it so I know which one's mine in the morning. But honestly, uh, I, have, I have no sense of my clothing style anymore. You know, you wear this every day, and it's gray and green. That's fine. Um, but I'm the hist historian, um, and I'm the historic weapons safety officer. I'm the one who monitors the reenactors who come in for safety, make sure that nobody gets hurt. I keep track of the gunpowder, things like that. You know, and uh, now as, um, as a historian, I'm also uh, kind of Mr. Woolsey, our superintendent's uh, right-hand man when it comes to being in public like this. Uh, at, at this point in my life, I have no shame, so I, I, I'm a, I, you can't embarrass me. You know, I'll go anywhere and talk, whatever I may. So, uh, now, James Woolsey it anticipated a program by this title. Essentially, Springfield Armory protected our nation. And I've brought up a few visuals to take you through that. I'm not going to take quite the standard one, as you might think. It's not going to be just one thing after another, like some people say history is just one darn thing after another. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, try to focus on some recent discoveries and some of the history which you probably know less of or don't know at all, since some of it actually almost nobody knows about, but maybe one other person and me. And so hopefully there won't be that way for long. So I'm going to uh, introduce you to some of the discoveries we've had, particularly in the 18th century and then into the uh, more modern era. And some of these may surprise you. And of course, I won't neglect the big story. Any questions on, uh, from anybody, by the way, on anything? Uh, Charlie, one of your members, was nice enough to bring in a Springfield rifle. It's an 1894 Krag, and I'll introduce you to that. It actually uh, has, it comes in at a very important time in the armory history at the time when there's a transition to modern production methods. First thing to think about is the armory has a long history, coming all the way from uh, 1777 as the main arsenal for the Continental Army in the Northern States and serving the uh, Hudson Valley. It was established early in 1777, and it starts moving onto the grounds that it's on now uh, late in that year and early the next year. So you're looking at its identification at Springfield hardly eight months after the ink was dry in the Declaration of Independence. In fact, some of the signatures were put on less than six months earlier. That's uh, pretty early. And it's the same two blocks you see now in the hill shops. There was a water-powered area which was added in 1794 when the, what was then Springfield Arsenal, which was storage maintenance and during the Revolutionary War production of ammunition, uh, was uh, then enlarged to include manufacturing, and development of small arms, that's muskets and shoulders, arms like rifles and such. Uh, and uh, that continued up till 1968. We provided the Army with the weapons they needed, uh, with the ability to ramp up production rapidly. That was the idea. But in the course of things, we became a major research center. And at a time when there was virtually no com c uh, c industry, anything like it of this size, we became one of the nation's largest factories. Now remember, it's government-owned, U.S. Army-owned. In almost two centuries, it had only one customer. So it's very distinctly different from the private business or private enterprise. It's the same kind of process of the government assuming risky technology that brought us things like GPS, the internet, and such, even the space program. Uh, Springfield Armory came in at a time when the nation and the national leaders realized that we needed to develop better industrial systems, but the private sector, private industry, did not have the funds and the wherewithal to actually do that. They could do it on a small scale. Springfield Armory 
pioneered that for the nation over several generations, and I'll go into that. And by the 1840s, they had it in hand. So it really gave the nation the tools it needed to become the world's uh, most industrialized, precision, interchangeable mass production center, especially for military weapons by the time of the American Civil War. Probably precisely the wrong time for some people in South Carolina not to declare war against us, but they did anyway, with predictable results. But we'll get into that later. Uh, so let me see. I got a pointer here. Let me see this. Uh, any questions at any time, just ask. Okay. So, yes. Right. They're actually the main, both of them are the main armory. Uh, one is they call the hill shops, and dating, well, that's where the museum is, right. And the water powered area is the hill shops along Mill Street, a Mill River, right along here, just closer to you. And that's where the heavy metal and wood shaping was done from 1795. There were actually three separate mills. And in the, in the late 1850s, they consolidated all three into the, what is now the upper one, and it's now in private hands. Now where the, where the devices made? Down below? They were made in all, all over. All over. Yeah, you had the um, forging, wood shaping, uh, welding uh, early on for the muskets, and all of that was done with water power. And then they did the uh, handwork earlier on before steam and electrical power came in, up the hill, assembly and storage, and the, once they got electricity in and steam power, you were able to include the upper part up around State Street, where we are now, uh, in that process. But it was always involved in that. It was a big operation. It's just about a mile separating the two, but it's not too bad. Yeah. They call it the armory, but it, we, at the time they knew it as the hill shops, so the whole thing would be the armory. Now, the difference when you hear the term arsenal, because our big museum building is the main arsenal, arsenal is equivalent to an, in, an industry, a manufacturing facility, as a garage or a parking lot would be to General Motors. Okay? So the armory needs a place to store and maintain its weapons. That's an arsenal. That's all it is. An arsenal doesn't make the weapons, the whole armory does. So think of that analogy. <laughs> yes? Some of them are. Uh, the water powered area is, but that's about it. And the, well, it was never included on the historical map when it closed in 1968. And the smaller block, Federal Square, which if you go up, it's the smaller one to the east, uh, that was never included in the National Historic Site area, which it, regrettably it wasn't. Uh, but all of its buildings are historic. They date back. Probably not at this point. Probably not at this point. The state has that. But uh, we've recently had the difficulty with the, uh, there's one very modern group of buildings in there. You see it on Magazine Street and just around the corner. It's called Building 104. It was built in 1940. It was uh, opened by President Franklin Roosevelt. He came and gave a great speech. And it was the first purpose-built, state-of-the-art, from the ground floor up, fluorescent lit building in the United States. It was the uh, envy of, of every place. It still looks like a modern building. In fact, it, um, it doubled uh, rifle production, M1 rifle production, uh, within a year. Uh, huge result uh, for the infantrymen to have that rifle available, and it was happening in that building. Uh, so recently, however, the state has decided to, first decided it was going to demolish the whole structure down, and it, uh, as historic commission members, you'd be interested in to know that they were working with a private group that wanted a parking lot and needed it to compensate something else. And unfortunately, the historic commission was not notified, neither was the proper authorities. And eventually, the, the word did get around, and we were able to reach a compromise so that the important structures at the end and the wall along Magazine Street will be retained, so from the street it won't look any different. But the wide open space uh, that comprised the main part of it will be taken down and made into a parking lot. You know, but so we realized that uh, in the National Park Service that 
we, if we had educated the public properly uh, more aggressively, they would have understood, and this would not have happened. It's quite the way it did. But I think we did pretty well. That was uh, James Woolsey, uh, who now lives in Longmeadow, and the superintendent uh, had jumped right on that. He was very good at that. So, it, um, so by and large, we're, yeah, we're glad we got what we do. You know, most places, uh, there are no almost nothing left. We have all this left. It's pretty good, actually. So let me uh, get you here. Okay. You might recognize some of these places. Uh, they, we have, this is focusing on the production right here, because remember, we're a factory. So let me see. Here we, uh, there we go. Have I got that? Oh, I don't have it on. That's right. It's like my computer at home. What's my problem? It's not plugged in. Oh. Uh, this is a nice image from the Federal Square area, looking toward what is now the museum. This is about 1852, this image is made. And it hasn't changed that much. Here's your, federal, here's your Federal Street. There's what is now the center of what is now more brick buildings, uh, all closed in together. And this building's still there, Building 27, forging. And the big grassy quadrangle, and us with the flag flying. Oh, by the way, the flag is not flying at the moment because the rope broke, sorry. But usually we are. Uh, so don't take it, don't be alarmed by that. Uh, this is a great photograph. This is uh, taken in September 1886. It's uh, one of the series of pictures of the employees. In all the others, the employees are sitting there in their, in their suit coats. It looks like a, a high school graduation picture. But this is the stocking shop, and they chose to come out in their work clothes. Each one of them is holding the piece of work which, that, which he is dedicated to working on and shaping. And he's got the tools that he does it with. And it's uh, a great thing. You get the guy down here with the basic rough stock blank and his tools, his caliper that measures it. The next one that moves it a little further this guy has a caliper for measuring across the lock. And it goes right on up. Behind this little piece here, which you can't see, there's a guy with a broom. There's this guy, who's one of the most important guys. He has a clipboard. He's the guy who watches everybody else and counts what they're doing. Because they're being paid piecework. He's the bean counter. But you have to re recall, Springfield Armory invented the bean counter. So you can blame us for that. But that's how it happened. That's part of mass interchangeable manufacturing. And this is the top a guy, top inspector, with a finished gun and his stamps. This is Samuel W. Porter. And Charlie, that's the guy who stamped your musket, SWP. And that's him, and that's him just um, eight years before your musket was built. This guy, James Stillman, is the foreman. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's a little piece of paper stuck to the gun stock right there. If you blow that up, you will see that it has stencils on it, numerals on it. And the top one says 1834, the bottom one says 1886. When you realize the picture is taken in 1886, and he started work making flintlocks in 1834, it's a message from him to you, to the observer, that he's been at this job for a while. But now the big difference here that comes in is that these men are well paid, highly skilled, and at the time, there isn't a one of them that's making under $30, $35, $40 a month. James Stillman is making $130 a month. This is at a time when the textile workers are making $10 a month. And it is this kind of industry that begins to predominate because of Springfield Armory by this time throughout the valley. Uh, up through the 1830s, you have textile mills employing most of the industrial labor force in Springfield. After the 1840s, no. It goes over to high-skill, high-wage, precision metal cutting. And that spans out into not only firearms industries, but into things like bicycles and typewriters, uh, locomotive car, uh, in train car making. It all starts coming, and Springfield becomes the center of it, and spreads all throughout the valley, as it still is a highly industrialized valley to this day. And it makes this area wealthy for well over a century. It's a very happy city, big social life, broad avenues. Most of the institutions you see, particularly in Springfield today, 
the museums, the symphony hall, all these date from that period. And of course, like most cities, uh, it suffered deindustrialization in the last third of the 20th century. So this is a big difference. And as a result, these guys, you notice, are all guys, heads of household. They mostly, this is their career for life for most of them, and they often try to get their sons and brothers in there as well. Uh, textile mills, uh, what's, the textil what's the average textile mill worker look like at this time? You go to Lowell, which puts itself out as the big industrial representative. What's, what are you looking at? Female and children. Female and little girls, mostly, and little, bo and little boys. Uh, cheap labor. Uh, hardly any of them work for more than a year, if they can help it. They're in and out. They hate it. Uh, my brother worked in a cotton mill, and I worked in a mill. Believe me, <laughs> at the end of the times, they were not fun. And they weren't then either. You can get the oral histories at Lowell, they weren't. But uh, it's this kind of industry, though, the precision metal cutting industry, that makes a nation. Most industrial historians will point out there are really two industrial bases. One is cheap, plentifully produced, things like textiles. And the other one is high, qu high value, uh, products, and this is precision metal cutting, and any second-rate nation can make textiles. You know, today, second world, third world nations, but it's the ones who can make the precision interchangeable manufacturing uh, that take the leadership in the world, and that's what happens in the United States. Sp what Springfield Armory uh, gives to the nation then by pioneering this is the ability to do this. With By the 1850s, you have Colt, Smith & Wesson, Winchester, up and down the valley, many other savage arms, even today. And uh, not only that, but you get all those other industries. They all come in about then. And by the Civil War, within three years, Springfield Armory ups its production tenfold. By mid-1864, Springfield Armory and its private contractors who make as many weapons, fully interchangeable, identical weapons, produce in less than a month, every month, what the entire Confederacy produces in four years. And they do that every month. So by 1864, President Jeff Davis has to look out, see Grant digging in around Richmond and Petersburg, and knowing that before the month's out, the North has once again equaled your production for all your efforts in four years. You might as well just walk away. But they don't for nine months. But it's the, a Second World War, same thing. Springfield Armory produces the most advanced semi-automatic military weapon, the M1 Garand rifle, about an average of a million a year, so that all American servicemen have this weapon. It gives them a tremendous advantage tactic, ta tactically. And in the Second World War, of course, like most industries, a large part of the workforce are women. In this case, over 40 percent of them. And in fact, there are some of you here in, the, uh, in this room who have family who worked there at that time, and some of them were women as well, and some of them are still around. I've met quite a few of them. Well, let me move on. Let me take you way back. Okay, take, I'll get you back on the way back machine, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, okay, I will, I'll get quickly through some of this. Okay, is that the right one? Yes. George Washington uh, took Colonel Henry Knox, head of artillery, who just happened to be from Massachusetts, uh, suggestion that let's establish it in Springfield rather than Hartford. It was also to be established in Brimfield, uh, not in uh, the, um, yeah, Brimfield area, actually East Brookfield. Uh, but it, they figured Springfield's better, good location, right on the main highway. Uh, you can get things cheaper there, build better, and it's on the river, which you can't get naval forces up across the Connecticut boundary, but you can ship out, and it's close to West Point and the Hudson River Valley. So uh, he says, go with it uh, by February, and uh, Congress goes along with him. I love this picture of Washington, by the way. This is uh, the most lifelike picture I've seen of Washington. It's painted from life about 1787. So it's, uh, compared to some of the ones you see, he visited it as, uh, as, as president in seven, right after he was inaugurated later on. Uh, of course, it first gets on the map by Colonel Henry Knox's uh, train of artillery coming up Boston Road a year earlier to take the guns from Ticonderoga to Boston to break the British uh, stranglehold on that city and force the British out. Essentially, by 
1777, Massachusetts is independent. It's the first state to win its independence from the British. The British Army and Navy are no longer viable in the state. So to Springfield, you have Colonel Henry Knox, Washington, and General Nathaniel Green, all dependent on us. And these are contemporary paintings done about a year after that. Kind of interesting to see them as young men at the time. And our function was to make ammunition as well in the laboratory and to supply uh, repaired weapons and all kinds of equipment to the Army. A very important role. That's Washington's letter on the left ordering the, um, Springfield to be the place for it. And we are producing, uh, we have French uh, cannon carriage makers come in. They're making carriages for us and teaching us how to do it. And we're making uh, artillery ammunition, among others, grape shot, and these tin cans full of musket balls that are shot out of cannons, never mind all the musket work. We didn't know much about these, about this time. We had a lot of documents that we found uh, surrounding this. But the main function, uh, which we always knew about, which was the laboratory, so-called laboratory, or the uh, ammunition maker we knew almost nothing about. There had been some note from about 1850 that there was a page from the record book from one week in April 1778 saying that there were like 7,000 some odd musket cartridges made. But the rest of it they figured was all lost and everyone else did too. And this is now something new. Okay. So about Eight years ago, I get a call from an intern from Mount Holyoke College who's working in the, ma in the mass archives. As they move the archives, she calls and says, I have these three volumes of records, and they seem to have something to do with Springfield Armory. I just wanted to catalog them. So she explained to me. She started reading what they said, and it turned out that there were three volumes of the work records that were missing. They were day-to-day -day work records of the ammunition making of about three dozen a wounded artilleryman in Crane's Regiment of Artillery. And, uh, and they were set up like Excel, in a way, with the dates. For the first volume had the week, after that, the each page of the day, and the work is here and what they did. So I had the whole thing transcribed to Excel so we could analyze the production and who these people were. It was a really close look. And when I opened the book up to just about here, April, 1778, I could see the string binding was broken. It's precisely that week that was found in 1850. I found the rest of it, so here it is. Isn't that cute? Isn't that neat? So we're just getting this out. We c this is what they look like on the um, covers. So we have almost a little more than half of the days accounted for up to through 1880, the 1780. And they have written on it, you know, um, Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, work records, uh, you know, hours, and all this. And there's the roughly size comparison. And here's the periods. So I'm looking for the rest of it. Maybe it's still lost in the Massachusetts archives. And the laboratory is led by this man, John Bryant, who becomes our next superintendent after this guy. This guy commands into the mid-1790s, but works there almost till the War of 1812. He's Sergeant John Bryant. He had a foot shot off at the Battle of Stony Point, and he's put in charge. After the war, he's made into a captain, and he serves his whole career at the Armory. Uh, this is uh, our first superintendent, David Mason. And this actually came up for auction recently. It was his aiming device for artillery. There's his name. And of course, we didn't get it. It went to some, some collector. And this uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Smith from that same painting you saw earlier, uh, Confidant, Deputy Quartermaster General of the Eastern Department. And uh, all of them are right there working at Springfield. And during the Revolutionary War, we are making artillery for and making the carriages for uh, guns, particularly French guns. Uh, this is w the only one we have left. You see the same kind here, bronze field pieces. And here's a drawing done by John Trumbull on the back of a playing card. What he was doing with a playing card, I don't know otherwise. 
But uh, you can see there's the elevating screw, you can see one here, and the ammunition boxes and so on. This is the surrender at Saratoga, which, spring, which Springfield actually supplied a lot for and helped make possible. We supplied most of the ammunition for that battle. So we have a direct role in bringing the French in, in the alliance, and of course, eventually winning independence. And later on, we get um, one single day for each page, and with the summation of how much is produced on the bottom, you'll see here, it'll say, if they're making things for the artillery, what they're making, how many packs of uh, musket cartridges, the year, in this case, 1779, 17th June, the account of work done at the laboratory Thursday. Pretty cool, actually. <coughs> and by the end of the, uh, in the, by 1780, the war's gone south, and you get these records here that uh, state that they're cleaning the place out of all that ammunition, they're sending it down to Philadelphia, there's Henry Knox's signature. This is a little bit of a painting in the background showing a French soldier, an American soldier, the French flag and the American flag at the time, done about 1780. I thought it would give you a sense of it. And of course the surrender at uh, Yorktown gave us all this stuff, uh, again signed by Henry Knox, which is then brought into the and something which was totally off our vision until a few years ago, except for hints, was that our first guns don't start in 1794. We actually start in 1782, the year before the war officially ends, making bronze artillery. It's a big effort by the Army. They're going to make Springfield the site of the nation's first <coughs> bronze artillery factory. And you think, like, why haven't I heard about this? Well, we had only hints of it, but it really was off the radar of most of us. Now we know actually where that building was, what it looked like, and why they did it. Uh, we found recently that, uh, most of the documents for it. It was pretty cool. For 20 years, we were making bronze artillery, and that was going to be where we made our name. Uh, the Secretary of War, General Lincoln, in from Massachusetts, uh, declared that if a nation was to be truly independent, we had to make our own guns, and what he meant was artillery. At that time, you call something a gun, it's an artillery piece. So you had a gun permit, you had a permit for artillery. Okay. There's muskets, that's different. So you can always have muskets, fine, but unless you have the ability to hammer away and protect yourself with artillery, yes, you're second rate. So we actually get into casting our own bronze guns. And we get directly copy the British foundry at Woolrich. Woolrich is making the bronze guns for the British Army. This is an image here of what's happening at Woolrich. You get a big furnace, they're pouring the bronze out and the molds are in the ground and they pour them through the holes and cast the cannons and then here they grind out and uh, on a big lathe and shape the outside of the gun. Here's the, bronze mo here's the molten bronze coming into the molds. The cannons are vertical on the, in the ground in the sand casts and such. So, Woolrich was a lot bigger than what we could afford. This is what we built. It's actually, you can see the size of people standing here. It's actually quite large. Big chimney. And that is built in 1782. And it exists into the, sev into the 1830s. We're building artillery, we're building artillery for long guns, three and six pounders like this, and for the short howitzers, five and a half and eight inch howitzers. And, that uh, what's that? That building is where Building 17 now is, which, which, is, which is on the campus, yeah. It's right on the corner of the, um, the big grassy quadrangle. Yeah. And it later becomes the heat treating shop, and then it's incorporated into the forging shop, so it is now Building 27. But it's, um, so we really tried very hard, but it's more of an art than we were capable of keeping up with, and we're not very good at it. In fact, we're pretty lousy at it. Uh, we, we get the best people we can, but bronze casting, is, if any of you artists know that, it uh, requires more than just melting metal and pouring it. Uh, every time they did a test, I've got the records of the, many of them, about half the guns blow up, but the other half don't. That's what's important. So, <laughs> And then we uh, melt down those, that metal and cast up more guns, but every time you cast up bronze, you vaporize some of the zinc, which is, in, which is very important. Uh, to keeping the metal flexible and pliable, it gets more and more brittle, and we realize that after a while, but 
after, but as the war, as the time went on, uh, the need for bronze guns became less and less. But there were quite a few of these out there. They're still in government hands. So I've tracked them down. So that'll be, that'll be something to look forward to someday. That is the absolutely newest thing, by the way. You are probably among the only few dozen that know about this at all. Ta-da. <laughs> like that, huh? I think that's cool. You know? So it shows that we were a functioning factory uh, long be quite a bit before the musket production, that everything we did with musket production was pioneered by cannon production. Now, by 1800, we stopped that. For one thing, who's president then? Changes the tune. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson comes in, and he just basically uh, decimates the military, almost destroys the Navy, and he says, well, you know, we're not going to do any more cannon casting, nothing like it. We're getting out of that business. And um, so that closes down, never comes back. By that time, we're making muskets. But it's, uh, it was a pretty, pretty extraordinary thing to really discover and to actually get my hands on some of these cannons. And there are a few of them which, yeah, they could have been better, but some of them, a lot of them did work. So more for that in the future. It is also the site in 1787 of the major bloodletting of Shays' Rebellion. Uh, this is from a, an almanac, and it, uh, appearances here, uh, it's Daniel Shays here, and uh, Captain um, Job uh, Shattuck here from Concord. And you do have the bloody encounter. This would have been where uh, Walnut Street is, and Federal Street is today, and State Street down here. And this is where the museum is down in this direction. You would have had storehouses of weapons here and artillery, and this would have been the rebels coming down as sort of a parade. The rebels never fired a shot. They never formed a battle line. They basically came on as if it was St. Patrick's Day parade, seven across, and uh, trying to get to the site before anyone could hurt them. It was clear to them that the militia here was going to fire artillery at them. They thought there was one piece firing at them. Every time this piece fired, they all ducked, hit the ground, and the shot would go over their heads. When they got in close, they were in a trap. There's a gun here and two other guns over here, and the crossfire killed four men and wounded many more. And uh, that was quite a shock uh, for the, for the Shays and his men, and they scattered and regrouped, and they headed north where they were eventually broken up. But it was uh, quite a shock for everybody. The, the militia in line here never fired a shot. It was only the artillery. But it did make people aware that a stronger central government was needed within a matter of months, the Constitutional Convention meets. And out of that comes the, the draft and proposals for a stronger central government in 1787. becomes the Constitution. Yes, sir? Is East Long Meadow Redstone? I know. But it got hit with some rape shots. No, you, that, you remember that? Yep. That was at the Masonic building. You were going to try to get it. Did you guys get it back? Uh, the city has taken custody of it. We got a good reproduction up there, but we are hoping to get it. We know that uh, Congressman Neal wants us to have it. It was once in our museum, and we can only hope. It is Springfield. Who owns it now? The city. Somewhere in Forest Park and storage. So we'll see. <laughs> well, it belongs to them. What can we say? You know, we keep trying. We'll see what happens. Yes, is that what you asked? Is that photograph? Is this, is this, is this is a recreation, a painting done by Bryant White, who is a, a creative artist who helped uh, us and the community college do a website on Shays' oh, Rebellion. Those are, those are all painted in. Yep. Uh, this cavalry actually, horsemen actually wanted to rush out and run against the, uh, the rebels, uh, but they, uh, they were restrained from doing it. The attack occurred at, started at 4 o'clock in the afternoon with the sun setting at 4.30. Uh, that was deliberate. I suspect it was because Daniel Shays knew that if you had a questionable issue at hand, it was better to do it just before the sun set. That way, if you won, fine and good. If you didn't, Darkness is coming to cover your, your retreat. And that's what eventually happened. Richard, Any the fence wasn't built yet? No. Okay. Fence wasn't built until the late 1840s, late 1850s. Anybody here have uh, Shays Rebel, as, uh, Rebels in their background? Shays Rebels? No. I bet some of you do. I know I do. 
That's why my family came down from Vermont a century ago. We are, we are hot-footed up there immediately. Hit out for a century and a half till everybody forgot about us. <laughs> yeah. As I think they have, anyway. But so far, nothing's arrived, no summons at the door. <laughs> yeah, so the early armory starts looking like this. This is a, a survey. This is Walnut Street, State Street, or is now State Street. And um, this is the entire block, the old 1782 magazine. And then there's this block, which we are now. Uh, this all gets purchased later, but this entire piece gets purchased by the federal government. And some of these buildings, this is the old uh, foundry for bronze. And none of the buildings in this picture exist today. But we know enough about them from later maps when they still existed beside others. But let's know. These nine buildings in the center all burned down that year, and nothing has been built in its place. And we, this was the forging shops. Forging shops had a habit every 20 years or so of burning everything down around them because they send out all these sparks, including themselves. So you'll, you'll figure it out. It's about every 20 years the forging shops burn everything down. And uh, industrial accidents, you know. So this is a Revolutionary War soldiers barracks right here. You can see the chimney with the smoke. And these are homes with the smoke. These are offices and barracks. And there's the foundry with the smoke coming out of the chimney. These are st uh, weapon storehouses. These are filing shops. So these are archaeological features. We checked and found they're all still there. It's pretty exciting. And so we have this industrial setting all still there, undisturbed in the grass. Nine buildings, all from the 1700s. Yeah, all in the grass. Yeah, all beneath the soccer fields, including the Revolutionary War soldiers' barracks. The typical soldiers' barracks: uh, two chimneys, four fireplaces, four rooms. Uh, so, War of 1812 is a big shock to the Springfield Armory and to the Armory system, because we have a sister armory that's come on in Virginia at Harper's Ferry. It's younger; doesn't stop producing until 1801. They're producing roughly the same kind of musket. But we are producing them pretty much the old style that the Europeans did, where you have a model, it looks like it shoots the same kind of ball, but it's not interchangeable. We find during the War of 1812 uh, that the weapons uh, are breaking at an alarming rate and not being interchangeable, they're hard to fix. So the armory works hard to make a new model, and at the end of the war, they settle upon the task. They're ordered to make, try to make everything interchangeable. This is when it starts, 1815. Uh, this is a... Uh, a photograph I took here of the, uh, down at uh, another national park, Fort McHenry, with their volunteers. Uh, they make a pretty good image, don't they? That's all gunpowder smoke in the back, by the way. So we also have trip hammers at the armory at that time, and this is a typical late uh, 17, the 1799 flintlock here, copying the French model. So you see there's the Eagle, Federal Eagle, U.S. and Springfield stamped here. By the way, it might be interesting to know that before, se at before 1794, the Ordnance Department, or early 1794, actually went to West Springfield to talk to the town fathers and the people there and have a vote with them, thinking that West Springfield had better water power and was better situated for an armory. They wanted to locate it there. But the people of West Springfield rejected them, said they didn't want a factory there, they didn't want all these mechanics in town. They liked their farm city farm town. If they had accepted, this would have been West Springfield. Springfield would have never seen any of it. So, you know, who's to know? As it turned out, but within 20 years, uh, the selectmen who led that effort to push the army away uh, were rudely, uh, rudely accosted in public and newspapers and whatnot for, for making a big mistake. <laughs> but it's too late. So... So it's just another what if. Times could have been very different. So Roswell Lee pointed. And this is uh, his main office. He also establishes in the second floor here and then in the storehouse, which the Shays Rebels wanted, uh, he establishes uh, a chapel for all workers. Uh, you have to realize in Springfield, probably like in Longmeadow too, you have only one church. George Washington noted this when he visited in 1789. He said, unlike Virginia, there's only one church in this town. Everybody goes to the congregational church. Most of the workers, however, at the Armory are Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, some Catholics. 
you know. And they're not permitted to vote in town. They're not permitted to even live in town for the most part. And their children can't get educated in town. So we established an ecumenical church. By 1818, we are, they have an official commemoration observance of Christmas, first official Christmas in the area. Okay. You have realized Springfield doesn't really let its workers off as a whole in the retail industry until for, for a holiday at Christmas until the 1890s. So th this is what develops at the time. Here's the Hill Shops, uh, 1830s image. The, that building's still here, and these buildings are still there. They're just now added on to. This is looking from the museum. You can see there's cows in that quadrangle, that grassy quadrangle. There's a flagpole. Uh, here's the forging drop hammers, of course. Here's your upper water shops, where your main water shops is built today. It's about 1830. See the Mill River running through it? A lot smaller. Here's the road that runs over to your, to East Longmeadow, right there. It becomes White Street and then North Main Street. And here's the, um, the middle water shops down the bottom. And again, in 1824, images that are blown up here of what some of those mills look like from different views. All brick, water powered, all through here. And this is, and then the lower water shops where the gun stocking was done uh, had Thomas Blanchard's stocking machine. This is in patented in 1819, works like a key cutter. Right here, we have the only surviving original one in the museum. Most of them were destroyed in a fire in the 1830s. This one we have was used into the 1840s. This is Thomas Blanchard during the Civil War period when he's a rich old guy. But he's a very young man when he invents all this stuff. Uh, he invents the first machine which can replicate with less than five minutes the lower half of a gunstock shape repeatedly. It has its own memory system. It's basically the modern CNC system. It follows a, what people call a tracer. It has an iron gunstock shape here, and the wheel follows it, and the rotating cutter cuts it, kind of like a key cutter today, only in three dimensions. You replace that hard surface analog memory with electronic digital memory, and you've got the CNC system. It's the same thing. And this is a letter he writes to the superintendent with an earlier machine, the, the two years before, for doing uh, gun barrels uniformly. He is so creative that in 1825, he patents um, a three-speed gearbox for the automobile that he's just invented. He's riding to work in a steam-powered 2,000-pound automobile with, uh, th with uh, three gears on the stick, with, uh, with bevel gears. It's the first bevel gears ever made in America. He invents it. So he's quite the guy. He becomes quite the inventor afterwards. The army allows him to have that patent for quite a while. Oh, here's the forging shop at it again. 1824, here's the forging shop, and it's burning everything down around here. Again, this is looking toward Federal Street. It's looking east. So these all have to get rebuilt to the buildings you see today. There's Roswell Lee directing the uh, fire bucket brigade, and everything was a loss. And of course, the forging shops with their chimneys. And here's your uh, uh, cannon casting building right here. See, it's still there. So you reckon, see where you are? That was done uh, that week. Big difference comes in in 1842. Uh, the army takes over completely, top command, and you get this very stern man, War of 1812 veteran, who takes over to James Ripley. And under orders from the army, he is to get everything up to snuff, new machinery, new equipment. He lays off a number of people at first uh, for a few months while he closes the place down and brings the armory back up to a more modern standards. In the process, he lays off most of what we, we call today the labor leaders and brings in Irish, uh, cheaper Irish. Today, uh, they, they are largely um, illiterate, semi-skilled, but they learn fast. So the city gets this huge population of Irish, starting about the Irish Catholics, which is a big shock to the neighborhood, so to speak, and uh, especially to the realtors who are trying to make a killing on the need for more housing, but unknown to them until too late, he has bought up all the available property under the, uh, in cash 
and so and then God brought it into the army. So he, so the realtors have no love for him. And by 1852, 53, he's out of office. Okay. But this is uh, this guy really makes things move along. This is the first time then that Springfield Army is able to achieve full production and full interchangeable production. Uh, the tools that they needed for the Olympic, for the Civil War uh, generation later. Um, by the 1850s, the city is now a rich center, cultural center. Uh, these are, you know, not, this is when you see the Catholic Church, St. Michael's Cathedral coming in, uh, the town hall here. This is the view from the new build tower that you now see the, the, um, the museum in, and looking over the river valley, and the whole, the whole place is enriched. Again, by the 1850s, the federal government is now accepted as an important part of this town. It's not just something you're putting up with. It's not just, oh my God, yeah, there's that noisy armory up there and those rowdy rum-drinking workers, you know. Because so you now have these color paintings. These are from 1852, showing the commanding officer's house. Uh, this is what is now the museum, the main arsenal, 1850, 1852. And here's the water shops, 1858, coming in down here. So it's a huge investment. Uh, it's even shown in uh, images here. This is uh, Gleason's Magazine, 1855, looking up from Longmeadow toward Mount Tom. Uh, this is just about where Route 91 comes in and Route 5 comes there. You can see over here, there's your main arsenal building with the museum, as again with the flag flying, commanding officer's house, and the city below it looking north. It's quite a nice scene, isn't it? Look at that. Yes, it did. Yep. Had a spur. A spur. Which yeah. came out of East Palmetto. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the, the maps, mm -hmm. this was the eastern line that came up from South Windsor and East Windsor. Yep. And then it hit the armory. Yep. Uh, did all of the, the guns then at some point pass through East Palmetto? Uh, did you ship out of the I'd, Well, actually, very quickly, we, sh we had the line spur come in also on the north side okay. to get to get the guns out. So we, we had um, a railhead up on what is now 291, up on Page Boulevard area, yeah. which we continue to use right up until 1968. We put a testing center up there, um, which is quite the story itself. No, it was actually a, a, a spur. A spur, that's right. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, we also <laughs> set up a trolley line from the water shops up to the hill shops, and they had an electric locomotive. Uh, Throughout the late 19th and the 20th, all during the 20th the century. Right, right. So there was that connection as well, particularly when equipment was coming in, heavy equipment. Yeah, it was all, all of that was needed. The railroad, uh, railroads were built by the mid century. A lot of French Canadian workers building those, and the, the Irish digging the canals and whatnot. Uh, so you, yeah, uh, I've talked to one uh, older resident of the city who remembers how. The trolleys would run up Walnut Street in the day, but at about 1.30 at night, the electric locomotive would take the cars with the rough forgings and the rough cut gun stocks and bring them up slowly and steadily with the headlight of the locomotive on right up Walnut Street. And getting out of the bars one night, he found himself uh, facing down uh, this locomotive wondering, what's this coming at me? He'd never quite seen it before. But there it is. Okay, so Civil War, Springfield Armory is featured particularly in here in Harper's Weekly in September 1861. The war has begun just months before, showing the process every step of the major manufacturing of this full page ad. Manufacturing muskets, U.S. Armory, rifling machine, boring machines, uh, m stock turning machines, uh, cutting the mortises out, putting the musket together, uh, rolling the gun barrels, all of this. and you then have the ability and the act realization of this process. As you pump more money into it, more people, you get this uh, commensurate increase in production. Uh, tenfold, as I said, by within three years. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, uh, validation of all the efforts of the previous two generations to provide this. And it's really Springfield Army that becomes one of the, uh, the major, so to speak, secret weapons in the Union's arsenal. 
We're the only national armory at the time. The others are supplemental private contractors working under our tutelage and inspection to produce the identical weaponry. And uh, so here's the payoff. You put in all that work, you get the system in place, and now when the nation needed it, the North is able to come up with this technology and then just overwhelm uh, uh, the rebellious part of the country, indeed. So, and of course I already discussed some of that before. Of course the Civil War itself, uh, everybody paid a high price who whatever part of the nation was involved in. These are some of my favorite pictures here. Again, Springfield Armory muskets, this uh, early war Confederate with the Springfield Armory muskets. The Confederates are armed to a great degree with older ones or captured ones. These two Federal soldiers, both with Springfield Armory muskets from the Western armies. Uh, here's uh, a black soldier and his family. By mid-1863, uh, you have entire regiments, particularly starting with Massachusetts, coming in composed of African Americans. And this little picture here, one of my favorite. Any of you have ever seen this one before? It's not a soldier. There's one picture of a soldier in it. Can you see it? That little one right there. It's her father. And she's wearing black for mourning. I think uh, one of the saddest little girls I've ever seen. She's lost her father, and she's got a picture of herself holding the picture that she remembers him. So the Civil War's over. Here's uh, early photographs taken from the Tower of Springfield. You can see how it's growing. Uh, rich city now. There's the uh, cathedral, which the Armory helped build for the Irish populations that work there. Here's the uh, river in flood. It's about this time of year. That's West Springfield. You can see the, like an oxbow back here as the river goes over its bank and floods everything. Not very different from what you would see today if you didn't have the dams controlling the flooding. Water shops, 1858. Nice and new there. Uh, Bias Street Gate comes in as a picture about 1880. You can see uh, the Sentinel here with his kepi, a Civil War style kepi, and his musket at his shoulder, actually a trapdoor Springfield. And that's pretty much like this today. Uh, James Woolsey has taken pains with the rest of us now to remove the trees that were in the way and to start restoring this view. So you can stand there at the gate and see what was intended to be seen and see the main arsenal building up there. And it becomes quite the uh, popular place. Here's postcards about eight, 1905 showing, peop showing the whole area becoming like a, a city park. People are bi bicycling, riding their carriages. And, um, and of course, with all these plantings, it becomes literally a park, as it still is to a great degree. We're taking out, in fact, this year, many trees which were intrusive trees. And we have maps that the Army supplied about every 20 years, uh, mapping where every tree was. And we're restoring those trees, putting in new trees, and taking out the trees which shouldn't be there. In fact, we're working on restoring the gardens, the formal gardens behind the community officer's house. That's in the works, as well as the Rose Arbor. I recently had a woman who lived there uh, s uh, give me close-up pictures of the Rose Arbor taken in the late 1940s, which has just appeared we're going to restore it to. We have uh, only otherwise two pictures. Armory in the First World War provides the 1903 bolt-action smokeless powder rifle. Now, leading up to this is what I wanted to... Uh, Charlie, I'm going to get your rifle out. Okay, if you don't mind. Okay, right here. Springfield Armory makes a transition. Springfield Armory makes a transition to um, to modern smokeless powder weapons in the um, the 1890s. I gotta stick this in my pocket. That's fine. Okay. And they they get away from the old smoky powder cartridge weapons, and they adopt a modern bolt action weapon with a. Uh, five metallic cartridge in the magazine and a 30 caliber nice high powered rifle for the time and uh, they have a competition in 1892 for this international competition about two dozen foreign companies and two dozen American companies uh, try at that time the United States companies cannot match the foreign companies 
we've gotten so far behind the eight ball in firearms technology, believe it or not. Uh, the U.S. military has had no enemy to face but the Western Plains Indian, who was basically in the Stone Age, while the Europeans are facing each other, the Germans, the French, the British, they're all arm into the teeth and they are ahead of us by about a good decade. So we finally catch up with them a little bit, but we adopt a Norwegian design. This is a Norwegian design called the Krag, and it's actually perfect for the Army's use. You can have it loaded, you can put in a single cartridge. They like it a lot. It's still a very nice rifle, very popular for hunting and such. And this is what the Army takes to the Spanish-American War. Teddy Roosevelt's groups, they're all up at San Juan Hill, very familiar with this. That's, this is an 1894 model. The Army, the Armory, the Armory for its, for its cell, its role, we can hit the lights again. Yeah. The Armory has to suddenly get up with also modern production technology, which it does smoothly, and with modern steel. By the time of the First World War, which you uh, we have then adopted the gun which our enemies had in the Spanish-American War. We win the Spanish-American War, we fight against probably the only country, European country we could have beaten, the Spanish, and only in their uh, distant colonies. And the Spanish uh, have the superior weapon, it's a German weapon called the Mauser. Stronger, faster loading, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt is under fire, he becomes president, and he's one of the first to say, we've got to have that gun. Forget about this Norwegian design. And uh, being president, he had some clout, so they listened to him. He was a pretty hard person to say no to. So the model 1903, very famous weapon you see here in, the, in France, Springfield weapon, the Springfield rifle it's sometimes called, uh, still preferred today for much target shooting. And Springfield Armory not only provides that, but it also provides uh, instruction now to the Army to get up to speed on machine guns. This is part of, this is the staff of the machine gun school. And here is um, Major Julian Hatcher. If any of you have read Hatcher's notebook, Hatcher's Book of the Garand, that's Hatcher. And he leads it. And you have here the French 30 caliber Hotchkiss. Here is a Lewis light machine gun, which you would use on aircraft, a British machine gun, actually an American invented machine gun, but adopted by the British. Here's a French Shosho, one of the world's first assault rifles, and an earlier American machine gun. So Springfield Armory is very much aware that what the world needs, what the military needs, is the newest model of weapon which is going to be self-loading. The bolt-action rifle is manually loaded, and, but at this time the machine gun is coming into warfare, and with the, this weapon especially, like the Shosho, self-loading, one soldier carrying it, they hire this gentleman in 1919, John Garand, who seeks and gains his citizenship. He's been uh, living in Connecticut uh, since he was 10. And he designs a successful, durable, semi-automatic weapon. By 1936, this one here is accepted for production. Uh, during the 1920s, he built a number of different models. This is one of my favorite pictures of him. We just discovered it recently. It's a, as a little vignette within a much larger picture of machinist. You see the closer machinist here working on his milling machine. But way in the back, you see this candid picture of John Garand, coat and tie, about 1922, pointing to the blueprint. And here, an engineer with his holding against the blueprint his 1922 prototype rifle. I thought that was very cool. Because every other picture, is, he's kind of poised like this, posed and such. But here he's at work, doing his thing. So this is before Pearl Harbor. This is, uh, of course, the British-style helmet the Army's wearing and when it first is coming in. So we produce about 3.5 million of these rifles in 3.5 years of war. This is a weapon that all armed forces in the United States have, have available to them. It gives you the ability to, put, to fire eight shots quickly. Uh, with a, each shot with a single pull of the trigger, no manually loading ne necessary. In the time, your enemy might get one or two shots off. And any veteran who has used it uh, would testify its durability. After the war, Springfield Armory <coughs> takes on 
a somewhat different role rather than the main production center. It becomes the research and development center and does pilot production. So in other words, it will produce the weapon and then as it gets it going, the technology, it'll take in private sector contractors, uh, General Motors and others, uh, Winchester and such, high standard, and have them produce the weapons on the contract. And this is uh, the way it was right up until the time it closed in 1968. And the private sector, which had been lobbying to get all the money and get the army completely out of the picture, succeeded under Secretary of Defense Robert McManera, which was a, a, a considerable blow. And I think many of us would argue a tragedy to, for the uh, good of the American infantryman, who was not probably the main concern of Congress at the time when they did that. I suspect it was probably Wall Street was their major concern at that time. But you have some interesting scenes here. Here we are in the 19, early 60s. We've developed the M60 light machine gun and the M14, which is a derivative of the, Col of the M1 Garand rifle. Uh, the M60 is actually a derivative of the uh, Lewis light machine gun, which then led to the FG42 of the Germans. So this is actually der derived from German technology. We also have a testing center up in Page Boulevard where Smith & Wesson's retail center is and, on, and uh, by a body of water where all our machine guns and aircraft systems uh, were tested. Anybody recognize that body of water? The, most of the buildings are still there. We're going to be put in the... Yeah. What's that? Reservoir. Yeah, Quabbin Reservoir. The south end of Quabbin Reservoir, we put lots of bullets into that water. <laughs> it. But it's all going to Boston, so you know, what do we care? Right. It's, um, here you have a Quad 4 machine gun mount, and um, so we are going to be uh, putting signs up there for the state soon to help people understand what happened there. This was the main testing center for the U.S. Army for small arms and machine guns and aircraft weapon systems all through the Cold War. So what happened there was critical to our success in the Cold War. And the uh, center picture here is one of, my, one of the more interesting ones, it's John Garand, after he's retired, it's about 1962, he retired about nine years earlier. You see him right here. And he's holding his last design of weapon. This is a weapon based on German technology. It was very futuristic, no wood in it. It was a bull pop, that is the, it actually fed in right against the cheek. Short in the overall length, but long barrel. And it was far in advance of even what becomes the M16. And they had it a decade earlier, had it by 1949. Uh, these are, the, of course, the head of R&D here. But in here is, the, is something else that's happening at Springfield Armory, which is something which uh, I've been given the green light to do an exhibit on eventually. And you just get a hint of it. The, the gentleman in the white shirt, and you recognize him? Not in a, he wasn't an American before he came here. He came from Germany. He came here in 1946. He uh, came in Operation Paperclip along with Werner von Braun. This guy is uh, Atomoth von Loschnitzer. He was head of, <coughs> he's head of all research and development of small arms and aircraft gun systems uh, in Germany from 1933 to 1945. He comes here in 46 and he's now a major R&D person for Springfield Armory and for the United States. So he, wor he was top person in Miles' R&D. He's not a government official. He was a top industry guy. But now you have in one picture working on the same team up until Garand retires, uh, World War II's top American arms designer and Germany's top arms designer. Both of them at one time uh, on opposite sides of the war, both enemies at one time, now working together. So the United States adopts German technology uh, whole hog because we have so many of their former engineers and scientists here. Of course, it brings on the space program with the likes of von Braun. Uh, but uh, von Loschnitzer brings in Karl Mayer, who, is, who was the top physicist in theoretical testing systems. So he was Mao's and Germany's top guy for that. He then becomes the U.S. Army's top, uh, weapons, uh, top weapons tester and uh, a few others. It's, uh, it's a story that we haven't told much of. I think it'll be provocative. People will be wondering, uh, particularly von Loschnitzer, 
he is one of only about 10 people on the Albert Sphere who could actually sign for funding and money in the Third Reich without having to go through anybody else's signature. So he's brought in Operation Paperclip and they just sort of say everything's okay, you come in. You're too valuable to let you go to the Russians or anybody. And he, he loves America. He leaves everything behind. He comes with no more than his suitcase and a shirt on his back and his daughter. And he retires eventually to Wisconsin in the middle 1970s. And uh, to a, he just, he's just totally Americanized after a while. So it's a little, little sidelight. Any, any, of you, any, any of you aware of that? You could have expected it, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it was the Cold War. It was the Cold War, as such. And finally, the closing of the armory, 1968. These are pictures taken by a private individual uh, who has allowed us to show them. They're the only pictures we have of the actual moment of closing ceremony. This is the uh, that booth is right here. See it? This is April 1968. This is uh, Ta John Garand speaking. And this is the flag being lowered from the flagpole. See it coming down, that triangle? That's the last you see of the flag, the last time the armory was in service. And uh, after that, then you have what you have today. The state of Massachusetts taken over up to where it is, and eventually the Park Service taken over this portion of it. Any questions? I think I brought you a full circle there. Yeah. Yes? Uh, five and six, the uh, junior uh, officers' quarters. We're hoping that somebody that we can get entice some in, some uh, interested entity or institution to join with the state and to uh, occupy it to fix it up. Uh, it, it, it's a building is still salvageable. It's a wonderful building. So we're hoping for that, um, wherever it may come from. Right now, the older building beside it, Building 11, which is from 1807, has been restored quite, quite well, quite nicely, very respectfully. And it's occupied by the Western Massachusetts Regional Police Academy, sort of a place where all the towns and villages can bring their police forces in and train them so they're all on the same page. They can all coordinate. So who knows? We'll see what happens. If any of you, you could always move into it if you have enough funds, I guess. <laughs> it would be a very nice house. Um, any questions really now? I hope I didn't drag it on too long. I, I speeded it up a little bit as we went, but I wanted to get you to places which you probably didn't know about because you probably heard the story generally about production and such before. Yes? When did it become part of the Park Service? 1974, six years after it closed. We opened the museum after we refurbished it in 1978. So well, what was involved in that, the Park Service? getting it was that how did that decision well, come about uh, a few years before 1974 our representative bowen a street of this area uh, put out put in a bill in the house of representatives and uh, had it considered and then uh, made the rounds and it, it was it was met with favorable comment so it was written up went through the senate and then by 74 it was it was made into law after they you know they talked to the army they made arrangements for the arms collection so that the collection is, most of the army collection is a research and development collection for the army. It's actually the world's largest collection of historic U.S. military small arms, and it continues to be a research collection for the army. We have the army's uh, incoming engineers and physicists to their research and development program at Picatinny Arsenal in northern New Jersey come up about twice a year. And we introduce them to what prototypes look like. We actually run a class mostly right out of college. It's kind of an odd thing for park rangers to be doing, but, <laughs> but, it's, but we, we don't, some of us know more about green leafy things than I do, but I'm, I'm not good at that. So do the, um, the Army still actually own the collection and the Park most, Service? Most all the collection is owned by the Army. Yeah. Right, it's, it, it comprises uh, about a third machine guns. It's, um, it's quite historic. It was started in 1862 by James Ripley, the one you saw the picture of, when he was then uh, Brigadier General and Head of Ordnance uh, for the U.S. Army at the beginning of the Civil War. 
And so he orders it to become basically a Noah's Ark. Don't think of Russell Crowe. Think of, <laughs> think of something actually useful like that. So it continues to act as a reference collection for any engineers, anybody in the industry. And if you're a collector and you have a, a re reasonable reason for seeing something, you can see it all online. We have it all cataloged online. You can uh, put in a request and we'll bring the weapon to you. You don't have to get to go in the room with you know, 8,500 weapons, but, it's, uh, but we'll bring it to you. Don't worry, that's okay. We're, we're, we quite encourage that. We have a good library uh, with some, some good primary resources. Uh, archive about 100,000 objects, about 30,000 photographs. All the photographs of which I've looked at and cataloged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say that, yes. How many visitors do you get? Uh, we get about 20,000 a year, but we're expecting that to go up now with better signage. We just put in a short-range radio station with a little broadcast that will show up on the um, sign with the frequency. 17:10 a.m. I'm going to redo the broad I'm going to redo the recording because the first one was was too close to the microphone, kind of mumbly. Besides, I have a Boston accent, and it's really you know, I can't help it. What are your hours of operation? Uh, we're seven days a week, nine to five, and we're free. And uh, we will have. I think our next big program is going to be June 21st. We have what we call Armory Day, and it'll all be on our property. We're going to be focusing on uh, bringing in reenactors who will represent uh, periods from the War of 1812 through the <coughs> Korean War with the emphasis on Springfield Armory's uh, contribution to the American infantrymen through their technology and their development. So you'll have a War of 1812 U.S. Marine. He's actually from the USS Constitution. He portrays it there. And he'll be, uh, you can talk to him and learn what Springfield Armory's contribution to such an infantryman in the War of 1812 would have been. And then we, we could jump to the Civil War since we haven't found anybody from the Mexican War yet. And, um, and then of course there we have our largest contribution. We have uh, infantry and artillery, including one small African-American unit from Springfield that's growing and developing, uh, working closely with us. Uh, we don't have any Confederate. We're probably the only Park Service Civil War site that doesn't have Confederate. I, I keep uh, resisting and pushing back against those rangers who say, oh, but we should. We should have said, no, the Confederates never made it this far. And if they did, they, you know, they found, you know, they were locked away. No, we are you know, we were the, we weren't helpful for the Confederates at all. Now, do you own the quadrangle on the front? No, we don't. You don't. So mm -hmm. when you say your property, though, is that where you Well, the historic site is the whole block. So but we, our custody is actually SDCC. the parking lot. STCC is sitting on the National Historic Site, okay. but it, that's that's covered by Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how that works. So the, is your property then more or less behind the Overlooking this. Oh yeah, the land, all of that going down to Bias Street. That's all. It's all yours. It's about yeah. forty percent of the whole block. The Commandant's house. That's Commandant's true. house. Yeah, which we're looking forward to fixing up and opening to the public and such. What condition is that in at the moment? It's in stable condition, but it's not in particularly pretty condition. But it's stable. It's it's very interesting. It looks the same as it would in the sixties. Um, no, not as good. Okay, well, I mean, uh, the roads were never changed in the sixties. No, never changed. No, there's still the places where there was a, a closet that they made into a nice 1950s bathroom. You know, so we still have those 1950s bathrooms in there. <laughs> Which I actually like. I actually like appreciate that. You know, it's nice. But, you know, yeah. Do you happen to know um, what year they um, allowed the name Springfield Armory to be trademarked out? Because there's a company that's selling. Good question, actually. I, yeah, that's um, that's a curious thing. Actually, you had a weapon, didn't you, up in the box, which was Mark Springfield Armory. There is a private company that uh, used it uses the name. They did not buy it. It was in public domain. The Army and the Park Service did not think of this before this private Texas company decided that it was a business opportunity for them to uh, play on the famous cachet of that name and to change their name to Springfield Armory and trademark it with their lawyers. So in 1968, when the Armory closed, they no. lost their trademark on the name? Uh, no, the name was in public domain. Once the armory ceased to exist, the name was just floating out there. Domain. I mean, you could have adopted it by just filling out the papers to take the trademark. 
for making a cookie or so whatever, you know. And so, and those, so those guns are produced in Texas? No, no. Genesee, Illinois, actually. Well, Illinois, the company's okay. in Geneseo, Illinois, and they've been in existence since the late 70s. Actually, I've been um, emailing them back and forth in the last few weeks, trying to get them to, um, to uh, improve their website in different ways. Because we're, they don't have the phone number readily available. People go to Google now, they see us, we have our phone That's number right there. I? They call us, right. and, they, um, and they, yet they want to get a hold of them. And they can't get a hold of them very easily because the phone number is not readily available. You know, things like this, yeah. plus, that, plus the company represents itself as connected to us and our history, and there's no connection at all. And lately they've actually been using the cross cannons, which is yeah. the Army Ordnance Crest, and ours would say Springfield Armory, 1794. They put the word since in front of 1794 and think that, think it's cool when they got it. So in fact, that just can be a challenge. Sure it can. Yeah. But I suspect, I suspect that the uh, Army and the Park Service did not really want to challenge public industry, private industry. But I'm writing to them and just saying, you know, like, I wrote to them last week and got to their marketing department and pointed out to them that we get a dozen calls a day from your customers who aren't making it to you. They're not happy. <coughs> it's hurting the customer base. What and besides you that, you're getting our calls and you're wasting time. Yeah. You'll refer them to Smith and Wesson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like very much, hopefully they'll listen to me so far, uh, not yet, but I do have one good connection. Last summer I escorted um, the 20-something-year-old daughter of the owners, the, owner, the family that owns it, and uh, with, her, with her young uh, fiancé through the museum and she liked it. We got just fine and uh, so she's included in the <laughs> emails. So the family knows what's going on. The family knows the marketing department may not be serving their best interests. So I hope that they'll put some pressure on them. We'll see. It's a, it's a funny situation, particularly with their pistols like aren't even made in the US. Yeah, they're made in Croatia. They're made in Croatia and it's, you know, it's just a company. So. But it's, uh, it is very confusing. I have people who come up to the Armory and they think that we started producing muskets in 1777 because they read it on their website. You know, stuff like this. So, it's, <laughs> so, we're pro so, we have, so we really have a problem as a park, national park site uh, in terms of having this private entity that's confusing our public message. Yeah. Uh, every so often I would get a call from a uh, police department. Like I got the LAPD called me a few years ago from their, uh, their forensics, it was a crime scene gun, and it was one of their guns. And they had the good sense to call up Genesee, Illinois, who of course denied any knowledge of it. So, oh, it's got to be these, you know. Nice. And of course, it wasn't at all. So it goes on and on like this. So it's it's yeah, it's, it's one of these pesky things. I hope we don't have to waste much more time with it. I'd like to see it uh, go straight that way. But you know, business is what it is. American business is, you know, it's, you know, it's got moxie. It'll it'll do it. You know. Yes. Between 68 and 74, did anything go on at the armory? Uh, yes, but not at the armory per se. Uh, the museum was intact, and the army brought in a private contractor before the park service came in to manage the museum. They were called Springfield Armory Museum Incorporated, but they were a private contractor, and uh, that they did as best a job as they could. And then with the park service coming in, we were able to pick up the pieces. We've had a, had a pretty tight operation since then. At that time, there was some museum practices with the collection, which we had to pick up the pieces for. Some things disappeared. We retrieved some of them. Some of them are good stories, believe me. I'm sure. I'll tell you just one of them, OK? And then I can, oh my god, it's 20 past 8. Sorry. Had you here for over an hour. Uh, generally, we're, we're pretty kind to collectors. And we, we encourage collectors to contact us. If they have something of ours, no problem. You know, get it to us it's pretty soon. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, but we did have one important weapon disappear. Uh, it was a, a flintlock prototype, 1839, of a carving. Only one was built. It's clearly marked model, serial number one. That was it. And we became aware of it about seven years ago going to be sold at a gun show in Kansas City. Uh, it was, well, it was 2003. It was the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the 1903 rifle. So we arranged to show up at the same show 
setting up a table with a display about the Model 1903, like a few <laughs> tables down from this guy, along with the same FBI agent and team that got the, uh, Bill of, the North Carolina Bill of Rights, which had also been stolen. And uh, so everybody loved our little show. And at some point, we went with the FBI down and they all showed our badges and said, that's ours, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the guy, fella had gotten it through a legitimate auction house, which probably knew better. So he got his money back. And that auction house, uh, of course, got, had their insurance when they tracked it down as best they could to recoup the cost. <laughs> And, uh, but something like that. So we have that, and things like that happen, you know, occasionally. But by and large, it's not been much of a problem. And we're pretty tight on security, particularly when you sit in on what we have to sit on, you know, between modern weapons and antique. And we have the world's largest and best Confederate collection, for instance. Never been in private hands. Came straight from the Confederate Army to the U.S. Army. Confederates are very nice about that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so it, uh, it's never been mucked with. If you are studying Confederate weapons, we're the place to go because of that. We know where some of these, what battlefields these weapons came from in many cases. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. and we showed that to the American side. Arms collectors last May had their best Confederate people in them. After we picked up their jaws off the floor, <laughs> including one guy who had his, he had the cloth, he had the cloth glove, and he was holding on to one, and his brain disconnected from his eyes and his fingers because. We kept telling him, you gotta let go now. You gotta let go. <laughs> <laughs> and he like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he couldn't, he couldn't get his fingers to, to open up around it. So, so we have, a, we, we, I'm glad we do what we do. We do a good service for the nation. We also do a, good, a service for the Army. We're probably the only national park site which actually has a role in helping the nation develop the next generation of small arms because the collection is so valuable and <coughs> continues to be modernized a bit by the Army here and there. So. Uh, you're welcome to look into it on our website and contact us at any time. I have a few cards if you want to meet us up the street. So, thank um, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.